Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Welcome everybody. Um, if you're just joining us th for this session today, we're happy to have you. My name is Jill Hawthorne, I'm class of 87 and the Associate Director of Constituent, Enga uh, Constituent Engagement and Campus Partnerships. Um, the Family Orientation Program is brought to you by the Alumni and Family Engagement Team, but definitely um, made possible by all the support and information and knowledge that we have from our speakers. So without much delay, I'd like to turn it over to Sandy and Kirsten to talk about COVID-19 updates. Hi, y'all. I'm Sandy Vasquez. I'm the Vice President for Student Affairs. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I've been at Pitzer for five. Now this is my fifth year. Uh, and hi again, everyone. Uh, Kirsten Carrier, uh, one of our associate deans of students and the director of residence life at Conference Services. Um, I use she, her pronouns, uh, and this is my uh, ninth year at Pitzer coming up here. Um, and Sandy and I are going to tag team this presentation to um, hopefully give you all kind of an overview of uh, what the guidelines are for uh, campus this fall semester, uh, what our current plans are, kind of where we get our guidance from and things like that. And a lot of the information we're going to share with you today is on our uh, Pits or Pathway Forward website, um, so you can definitely take a look at that. Um, yeah, and uh, it's a very similar to the information we'll be sharing with students in the coming days as we work them through the orientation schedules. Um, Sandy, I'll hand it off to you for this first one. So one of the things that, you know, before we go into, into the actual slide, I did want to share with you all, you know, some, some parents have been reaching out, um, you know, to provide great feedback on, you know, how appreciative they are for support providing and provided to students who maybe have been asymptomatic or symptomatic um, and the support from our 24 seven on call team who's here on the ground to provide support to your students. You know, what I want to share with you all is that we are so proud that, you know, the rate of our student vaccination, um, you know, record submission has just been remarkable. Some of you may have heard me share that at an earlier session, um, and that's ahead of the start of classes. Um, our students truly are examples of living out our ethos that is student led, mindful of each other um, in action. and. You know, one of the things that I want to share with you all is that this is a new normal that we're all going to be navigating, both, you know, as a part of our staff, um, but also our student community um, and our greater community within the Claremont Colleges Consortia. And so I say that to say that, you know, we understand that the, the data continues to share that while, you know, the vaccine um, may not fully protect someone from getting COVID, if there are breakthrough cases, um, the data is suggesting that it's a very slim chance that there may be, you know, severe um, type of scenarios that are implications, but that, you know, there may be more mild um, symptoms that may emerge. And so I, I want to share with you all to hopefully give you some peace of mind and reassurance that, you know, we fully anticipate that, yes, there will be breakthrough cases. I mean, I, I at some point may also, you know, be susceptible to um, getting a breakthrough case myself, but also I am fully confident in the support and the planning um, of our team um, to be able to navigate this new normal um, that we're all living together. I did want to share with you all that, you know, as a reminder, we have been working uh, diligently with students around the clock to proactively work on getting their vaccination records uploaded. Um, and we're at a place now where we are ready for um, the move in upcoming this weekend um, of our students, students that did not cooperate with our multiple modes of outreach, um, personal email text message. Um, you know, for some, we even went the route of trying to connect with them via social media, um, connecting with parents. Um, you know, we understand that, you know, for some students that maybe that, and it's a few that um, maybe they, they really, you know, the sense is that maybe they felt that they're not ready to be here at Pitzer um, this year, but those students will not be able to enroll in classes um, this semester. The other thing I did want to share with you all is that we do have um, COVID-19 um, testing um, expectations 
based on recently uh, released guidance from Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, we decided uh, to be proactive and to follow the best recommended guidance to facilitate routine weekly testing of our students um, that we will evaluate uh, on a monthly basis, um, especially as we reopen and adjust um, to life back on campus. Um, we, we want to be able to mitigate um, proactively you know, any emergence of any um, patterns or trends, um, but also to help our students adjust to our new normal. Um, we want to be able to make testing accessible proactively to students, no questions asked. Um, and, you know, to facilitate that being just a new part of our campus community culture and daily life as well. And so, um, you know, if at any point one of your students may, you know, feel for whatever reason that they want to be proactive just to take you know, uh, personal safety precautions or measures or, you know, for the greater community good, if they feel the need to test, please encourage and support for them uh, to do so. It'll be at, at no cost to them through student health services. Um, we are working currently on um, activating also additional medical assistance support on site here at Pitzer um, to, you know, provide enhanced support um, in addition to student health services as well. In terms of the contact tracing process, um, I did want to share with you all that contact tracers are um, working through student health services. Um, and anytime that there is a situation where someone has been identified as a close contact, um, as symptomatic, um, you know, the contact tracing team will be notified, um, whether it's by a medical evaluation conducted by student health services or by a consultation evaluation provided by 7c.health or if there is a report from one of our on-call members or, or one of our staff members or if the student may self-report um, and make outreach for support the contact tracing team will then um, begin the process of making proactive outreach to any and all close contacts that may have been um, in close proximity to the impacted um, student and to be able to determine uh, from a medical recommendation perspective, whether if someone tests positive, for example, um, they will partner with our team in order to implement isolation procedures. Um, if someone is a close contact, there may be the modified quarantine procedures that they would recommend that we implement. Um, and in, in addition to that, they will also work with us to inform us of any negative uh, test result clearance. We will work with students closely who may be uh, symptomatic um, or um, maybe resulted in a, um, a screening through Healthy Pitzer um, that resulted in a, a red check mark uh, response. Um, to work with them to be able to learn from them, it, you know, with the flu season upon us. You know, it may be something that's completely unrelated to COVID-19 that we work with them, um, you know, for the, the medical evaluation and, um, you know, clearance um, recommendation um, that it has nothing to do with COVID in those situations. Um, and so, especially as flu season is upon us, please, I want to also note that we will be uh, requiring the flu vaccine of all students at the Claremont Colleges and at Pitzer as well. Um, and then in terms of isolation and quarantine, um, we do have designated quarantine and isolation housing within our campus housing to support students. Um, this is activated, um, you know, if necessary, uh, with support from our on-call team who works 24-7, um, who can activate support uh, to students. That ranges from everything to preparing the space for students helping to facilitate um, the delivery, personal delivery of meals to their door um, so that they, they have nutritious meals um, from our, our dining services on campus um, to activating wraparound support for mental health and well-being um, and ongoing connection with student health services for support. But in addition, also academic support services in partnering with faculty to identify what may be the best course of support um, to be successful in the classroom. 
And so I'll go ahead and, and um, you know, hand it off to Kirsten at this point. Great, thanks, Sandy. Those are, you know, some four really big buckets um, uh, as far as our COVID response on campus that we're really paying attention to. And I did, again, want to point towards our Pitzer Pathway Forward website for this next part. Um, we're going to walk you through uh, slide by slide um, this COVID-19 expectations video. Um, this is a video that we'll be showing to um, all of our students during orientation on their first night of orientation. So we really do make it clear, um, but, you know, right away on our campus, get to know a few other students in an icebreaker, and then let's talk right away about COVID um, expectations and, and our, um, uh, our return to campus this fall and what we need from them. Um, so instead of actually playing the video for you, I'm going to just kind of share the slides um, slide by slide um, so that we can uh, walk through it together and, and Sandy and I will um, kind of tag team the content here. So it's gonna be one second to share it. Uh, and again, you can click on this video and go through it yourself as well. Um, so this is what the video covers step by step. It's gonna cover kind of where do we get our health guidance from? Uh, what kind of health measures and guidelines do we currently have in place at Pitzer and the other Claremont colleges? What to do if you develop symptoms, you're identified as a close contact or you're positive for COVID-19. And then what is all of our students role in keeping our community safe? And then our motto for COVID uh, this whole time has been being mindful of each other. Again, playing off of our Pitzer, uh, mindful of the future, but also mindful of each other in this moment. I already talked a little bit about this website, but this is just a reminder for our students that this is where they need to go to look for um, updates. Um, as we have them, we'll push them out uh, via social media and uh, email as well um, when we have them. Um, Sandy, can you talk about the community agreement? Sure. So Victor's community agreement, um, you know, was developed earlier on in the pandemic, um, and we have revised it as the guidance has evolved. Um, it's a document we're proud of. Um, it was um, vetted through the COVID task force. Um, that includes student voice, faculty, staff voice. Um, and we decided uh, resoundingly that we wanted in the true Pitzer fashion, a community agreement that all of us would unite together um, and stand by. Um, and, and that's grounded in that ethos of mindful of each other, which was designed by our students. Um, and so for us, you know, being fully vaccinated for student return to campus was a uh, priority for us. Um, again, you know, we've had resounding, um, outstanding um, response from students. Um, we worked uh, very hard over the summer proactively with students to get access. We also continue to work with students um, for early arrival support um, from an equitable uh, place to students who maybe didn't have access um, at, at their uh, home uh, country. I'm sorry, I, can you scroll, can you go to the next one so that I can? Um, and so the other piece that's important um, in terms of the um, community agreement is really grounding expectations around masking requirements indoors for all students. We, uh, we have created um, central hubs, both in the Office of Student Affairs, the Gold Student Center, and the Office of Residence Life, where students, uh, when the offices are open, um, can come by and pick up a mask, no questions asked if they need one. Um, our faculty and staff um, also express interest, and so we're also providing support to them as well. Again, we're trying to be as proactive um, with norming um, and uniting together and providing support and leaning into community as much as possible. Some of the questions that students have asked um, ha around this have been, well, well, will we be able to allow our friends from the other campuses to visit us? Will we be able to um, visit them? Um, you know, for us at Pitzer, Yes, you know, students are allowed to bring friends from the other Claremont colleges. As you could imagine, um, we are asking uh, from a safety perspective for students that have guests that do not reside in their residence um, over to their, their residence that they please mask indoors. And more than anything, we're facilitating a lot of outdoor activities. Um, especially, you know, working with our clubs and organizations, um, you know, for events and programs to really reconsider, um, you know, indoor versus outdoor. Um, we've got a lot of board games, we've got a lot of, you know, blankets. The students love the mounds. It's a Pitzer tradition um, to hang out on the mounds. And so 
we're doing everything possible to be able to provide students with you know other outlets to be able to engage safely and in partnership with us um, you know we will share with you that we've also been working with students around um, you know travel quarantine requirements we are working um, proactively to build an online form. We know that some students and families have already reached out and we're grateful for that and saying, hey, we've delayed our vacation plans for, you know, winter break and, you know, we want to be responsible and make sure that we honor any, you know, quarantine guidelines upon return. And so we'll be able to provide a link um, to students to be able to complete that, um, you know, to let us know of, of any, you know, uh, travel um, by plane so that we can be supportive partners and, and helping them, you know, facilitate and engage in, in practicing being mindful of each other for the greater good. Um, again, you know, we don't foresee the indoor masking requirements to change in the near future. Um, you know, we anticipate that as guidance continues to evolve or to relax that we will continue to monitor that. And I, I definitely wanted to highlight um, as well that there is this kind of hierarchy of decision making, right? You're going to get the national level kind of CDC guidance that comes out. But here at, at Pitzer, we're going to need to wait for the state of California to adopt that guidance and then LA County to adopt that guidance and the Claremont Colleges to talk about it and then Pitzer to talk about it before any Pitzer level changes would happen. So just to have patience with us as we work through those processes, if you're seeing larger national decisions being made, that it can take a little while for us to make those more local decisions here. Um, and that LA County has been one of the, you know, kind of strictest when it comes to response to COVID throughout the pandemic, uh, given our, you know, our densely populated uh, county. And so um, just to have patience that it's very, it's different here than in other parts of the country. And I think the other, you know, item to note is that, you know, you've probably seen that after move-in, we are moving to creating a bubble um, whereby any non-Claremont colleges um, or Pitzer community members uh, of the public will not be allowed on campus. Um, and really that is because we are trying to take the most, you know, uh, greatest precaution, um, you know, to be able to help our community to readjust and really focus on our own internal, um, you know, safety, well-being and transition back to campus um, after so long um, in the midst of navigating, you know, the most recent guidance. Um, and again, we will continue to evaluate that, um, you know, folks from the public, if, if they are approved to be on campus, let's say if we have a an amazing guest speaker that we want to bring to campus that you know will approve to, to come on you know we want to make sure that we also provide a safe environment for them as well we talked a little bit about guests already but here's just a note that I mean, every claremont college can make its you know own decisions when it uh, comes to how they're going to handle COVID on their campus and so we do have quick links on our pathway forward to the other colleges um COVID response websites and so your student may have questions about what can i or can't i do at scripts uh, and their campus and again our campuses are very integrated our students are taking classes together they're in clubs together but there are some restrictions as well and so we encourage our students to get to know the other campus websites if they're spending time on the other campuses. Um, we do, you know, try to make those bigger decisions like masking as a whole, but sometimes certain institutions move more quickly. And so um, just keep apprised of that. I've already had one uh, question here in the chat that I'll answer live and, and talk a little bit about this. And, and I know this was, uh, you know, some of our newest recommendations, like Sandy said, based on a really recent um, phone call that we had with LA County in, in you know, response to the, the surge of Delta um, in our area. And so uh, one of those is kind of this new uh, move in expectation. Um, so the students, our students have already done a great job with their vaccination records. So we do not need to see the student's vaccination record upon move-in. Students will need to get that PCR uh, COVID test three days prior to move-in and present that negative result at check-in. And again, a lot of nuance around that for folks who are having trouble accessing testing. You can see kind of our full recommendations on the FAQs page on the Pathway Forward website. But ideally, this is what our students are doing is three days before, get us that negative test upon arrival. If it's on paper, if it's on your 
your phone, um, show it to our check-in folks before you get your ID card and check in for the day. So that's for our students. For our move-in helpers, our families that might be coming, again, we're asking folks to limit that to just two people uh, per student um, coming in. And our move-in helpers need to show us proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test taken three days before arrival. Um, so our move-in helpers don't need to do both like our students do. They need to do one or the other. Um, so if you have proof of vaccination with you, great. That's all you need as a move-in helper. If you don't have that, then that recent negative COVID test. We are also asking everyone who's participating um, in move-in day to complete our Healthy Pitzer um, symptom screening form. It's at pitzer.edu slash healthy pitzer. Um, you can fill that out any time the day of arrival. So in the morning when you wake up, you can fill out the Healthy Pitzer form and be ready to go for move-in. We just need proof that you've completed it. Um, that green check mark will tell us you're good to go for the day and red check mark will mean you can't come onto campus for that day. Um, and then we are asking uh, for everyone participating to remain masked indoors and outdoors on move-in day. And, and yes, during the regular academic year, we're not gonna have masking outdoors uh, for our students typically, um, but move-in day is one big old large gathering uh, with several, you know, several hundred folks here, especially with those move-in helpers present and a lot of staff and faculty uh, and students helping with move-in as well. And so because there's a lot of folks around campus, we do wanna keep everyone masked on move-in day. So. You know, bring a couple changes of masks if you need to get ready to breathe through a mask and move a lot of heavy stuff because it will likely be a little hot. Um, and so, uh, you know, do what you need to think ahead about that, stay hydrated, um, get in some shade and all that. Um, so that's move in day stuff. Anything I missed there, Sandy? No, I think we're good. Okay. We've already talked a little bit about the vaccination requirements. Sandy, you want to talk about any unvaccinated students, those who are exempt um, from our vaccination requirement? Sure. You know, in turn, I know that there was a question here about um, how many exemptions we have granted. Um, not surprising to Pitzer, we only have one. Um, you know, I, I think that again speaks to the ethos of our students, their commitment to our core values. Um, and in that situation, then that the expectation would be twice a week testing, um, daily health screening form, um, masking for example, um, and as I shared, you know, as we head into fall, as you can imagine, um, you know, with flu season coming around, we recognize the, that there may be situations where, you know, someone may think, well, we're symptomatic, and then really the medical evaluation may result in, well, no, it's actually the, a symptom of the flu, it's not COVID. And so, um, we, you know, really would appreciate your partnership um, once flu clinics um, are set up here at Student Health Services and encouraging your student to get the flu vaccine, which will be required for all students at the Claremont Colleges. Um, I think we already touched on masking a little bit. So in masking indoors, the students will wear masks in class, that means. Uh, for now, um, they can take their masks off outdoors, um, usually, right, uh, when it's not a large move-in day or when it's not a large uh, event. We are probably going to have some large, um, larger events like our job fair or like our student activities fair where there will probably be uh, required masking because of the number of folks gathering outdoors. But beyond that, they can be unmasked outdoors. Um, obviously to eat in the dining hall, because the dining hall will be open for indoor eating for now, um, that they need to wear their mask when they enter the dining hall and um, when they're getting their food, but as soon as they sit down to eat it, they can take it off to eat and then put it right back on when they're done eating. Um, and we do ask that they wear a mask in any shared transportation. So if your students are, you know, carpooling to and from athletic fields or to a shopping trip, if they're with any non-household members, so if they're with folks that they don't live with, then they do need to be masked in that shared transportation as well. And then this is a reminder of our residence life guest policy. We talked a little bit about this. Um, our students can visit each other in their rooms um, on campus. Um, if other Claremont College students can visit uh, in their rooms, uh, we just ask everyone to be masked. So if there's even one student that doesn't live there in the suite, then everyone in the suite needs to be masked while that person is visiting. Um, and that's something that our resident assistants are aware of and will be helping walk around um, and help with enforcement. Um, we do have a lot of really great open air hallways um, in the residence halls. And so uh, most of our students, when they leave their, their door or they're unmasked inside, 
outside. They don't actually have to mask in our outdoor hallways. It is outdoors. Um, and that's past move-in day that they, they won't have to do that. Um, and then what Sandy said there, the, the non-Claremont College's visitors and guests um, are not going to be allowed inside the residence halls after those move-in weekends. And, you know, one of the things we've been sharing with students is just to be mindful also of suspending judgment or bias. You know, individuals who are fully vaccinated may still want to choose to socially distance, to wear a mask outdoors. Um, again, we can't stress, you know, the importance of being proactive, of getting tested, even if vaccinated, if, if there may be, you know, some concerns uh, or just a sense of, you know, I attended this large event and yes, I was masked, but I just want to, I want to, I would feel better and safe if, if I went ahead and got tested. Um, again, no questions after a walk-in appointments and we want to make sure that students have that support. Um, available to them as a resource. So now we're going to get a little bit more into the step-by-step -step for how you all can support your students. Um, if something uh, pops up for them, um, you know, likely that they're going to not feel well at some point during this entire academic year. And again, what Sandy's been saying, from cold to flu to COVID symptoms, all those things can look really the same. And I know that can invoke a lot of strong emotions for folks in this time, kind of worrying about what it might be. Um, so we want to make sure that you know kind of what our step-by-step -step is so that you can support your students through this process as well. Um, so again, the COVID testing is available at Student Health Services. It's walk-in. There's no appointments needed um, for regular testing. Again, there's the hours um, there as well. Um, if a student is symptomatic, we ask that they call Student Health Services first um, uh, and they can you know, review the Healthy Pitzer online form if they want a reminder of what the COVID symptoms are. Sometimes folks are like, I don't know what this is, so feel free to take a look at that and um, uh, see if your symptoms do line up with that. Um, so we encourage students to call student health services, be evaluated via phone if it's during business hours. Um, if it's after business hours, then they are going to use something called 7C Health. Um, 7C Health is telemedicine. Um, it's something that they can do a video appointment with a doctor 24 hours a day so they can get medical support or consultation after hours. Um, and then uh, we also ask the student to contact our on-call uh, folks so that um, they can just call campus safety and ask the Pitzer Dean on call. And that kind of activates our support for the student during the process. So you know, the medical professionals will let your student know kind of what the next step is. Like, we're going to need you to um, stay in your room for now. We'll get you access to a test. Um, or your symptoms don't seem like it lines up with COVID, so you don't need a test. And here's kind of other next steps you could take to get care. Um, and our on-call folks will help with those next steps. So if it's accessing a local pharmacy that delivers to campus or trying to get weekend uh, COVID testing locally or um, trying to get uh, access to an urgent care if they might need that. Uh, those are things that again our on-call team have are used to helping students um, you know figure out and activate. And, and I can't stress enough that the last bullet there about the contact tracing process and really encouraging your students to you know be fully transparent and cooperating. You know, we're grateful, you know, that our students thus far, you know, for our early arrivals um, have been great partners with us because the more proactive we can be in reaching out to possible close contacts, if you could imagine it, you know, maintaining the levers and, and being able to swiftly respond and support individuals who need the support or preventing you know, a, a, a spread um, of COVID-19. And so again, it's gonna take all of us in the community, um, especially the cooperation from our students um, to be partners in this process. Um, and I wanted to, to highlight the, again, this really supportive um, isolation and quarantine housing um, that we have on campus. So if you do test positive, if our students test positive, that our on-call folks, our student health services would work with them directly. We have, do have a website that's dedicated just to kind of like, what is quarantine housing? What do we provide um, in there? And so I can, I can put that link in the chat as well for you to review. Um, and if a student is diagnosed positive, we do again have that robust contact tracing process that we ask them to be really cooperative with and give us information so we can again protect our community and then identify close contacts um, who they may have had interaction with recently here on campus. 
Um, here's a little bit more about a close contact as well. Um, uh, and the top is just a definition. I know we're using a lot of like new terms these days, breakthrough, close contact, what are all these things? So um, we are using the CDC definition of close contact. And so our contact tracers at Student Health Services will be the ones identifying a student as a close contact. Um, and so uh, if a student wants to proactively reach out to us, if they hear that their friend is diagnosed and they did have substantial contact with us, you know, they can definitely reach or contact with that student. They can definitely reach out to our on-call staff to let, the, let us know um, that they think that they are going to be a close contact and we can support them proactively. But our contact tracing process will um, you know, interview folks and identify and make contact via phone um, to let folks know if they are close contact and what the next steps are going to be. Um, if uh, a student is cl a close contact and they're vaccinated, they're going to need to limit their contact for three days, uh, get a COVID test, um, and then as long as that COVID test is negative, we'll be able to clear them from what we're calling modified quarantine. Um, so it's a time period where uh, if they're close contact, they shouldn't be interacting with the rest of our community. They shouldn't be um, you know, participating in athletics or going to club meetings or going to classes. Um, they can grab food to go and um, can take a walk around campus, but really shouldn't be hanging out with anyone during that three day period until they get that negative test result. We'll continue to have communication with them and provide medical support should any symptoms pop up during that time. Um, and for our, any of our students who are not fully vaccinated or are, are exempt from vaccination, if they are close contact, they will need to fully quarantine for those 10 days and be tested as well. We also, for students, um, you know, really student voice led, they felt it was important that we have a COVID-19 uh, concerns or reporting form, um, but also not only to report concerns, let's say if, if they see a member of the community who isn't following masking guidance, um, or maybe they have a concern for, you know, a friend and they want to get them help or support, or maybe someone is experiencing insecurity by way of they don't have any mask access. And, you know, we want to be as proactive as possible um, and being swiftly responsive. And so this form is a 24 seven um, hour form. Um, let's say that there's a student that lives off campus and, you know, maybe they want to report that, you know, somebody threw a large, you know, party off campus um, and they want to make us aware of that um, as a concern and, um, you know, our team would activate response as necessary um, because as part of being Pitzer students, you know, we also are responsible for the greater good, um, even within our, our local community um, and our responsibility um, to be able to navigate through, you know, where we are with the pandemic, uh, mindful of each other extends to also, you know, life off campus um, in, in, the, in the residents, in the local surrounding community. So in addition to our community agreement, um, you know, our student code of conduct process um, is something that um, is in effect as well. Um, again, through the community agreement development process, um, we did integrate the expectations that student disciplinary action may be necessary um, while we really focus on social community norming and grounding and being mindful of each other. Um, you know, when necessary, we will take formal disciplinary action. Um, you know, our, our goal is to be educational, but also understanding that there may be times when we need to necessitate um, the activation of the implementation of, of student disciplinary outcomes. And that's really the end of that kind of student facing uh, video uh, kind of in a slide by slide for you all and can definitely review that information. Our plan is to keep that presentation um, as updated as we can as things change in the coming um, uh, days. Um, but we wanted to walk you through what we currently know at least. Um, and I think that was all we had for this lovely little presentation as well. I'm just paging through it. Yeah, there we go. We're open, Jill, to questions that folks may have at this time. Great. Okay. So we do have, um, there is a question in the Q&A about families being able to visit their students once, um, you know, they've dropped them off. Um, are they also still considered, you know, non-Claremont College folks? You know, if, if for the purposes of, of moving, we, because we're managing so many families coming to campus, we're really trying to manage the density 
um, of the population. So there is a scheduled time frame for move-in. Um, and we would ask you know, folks to try to honor that because we do have scheduled blocks to be able to facilitate ease of coming in and out of facilities. Um, you know, the other part is that we very much value parents and families as being part of the Pitzer community, um, you know, in terms of, I think there was something about like sporting events mentioned there, you know, we don't have all of the answers right now in relation to that, um, in terms of being able to attend sporting events or um, you know, community-based events or programs, but we certainly will partner with your office, Jill, and, and with, you know, Brandon to really be able to safely facilitate, you know, family engagement opportunities as well. Um, and in terms of, you know, sporting um, attendance at events and programs, we'll provide updates and information. My sense is that you know, there will be expectations that are baseline that you could expect, for example, masking indoors at all times, probably, you know, there may be some distancing um, there, you know, maybe ahead of time, you know, getting tickets ahead of time. And so I can't give the concrete details, but those are just some things that I could foresee. Um, and again, it's all dependent upon evolving um, guidance um, from Los Angeles uh, County Department of Public Health. Right, and thank you, and um, thank you for mentioning that. We are looking forward to um, partnering with your office um, for some wonderful family events this year, including, you know, Family Weekend, but also I know some of the um, athletic events are neat, and I think it is a good thing to think about that the events we all can handle and that, that families that can attend them would be welcome to, um, so that helps answer that question. So, okay, I think, um, you know, what I would say is that it seems um, there's a great website for frequently asked questions, and then there are also folks just simply reaching out if they do have a question that's following the session. So, um, and, you know, I, and so with that, I just do want to say thank you for walking through the information. Um, it it felt very nice to have it walked through in the pace that both of you um, did this. So thank you for that. Um, it's a little less overwhelming that way. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, thanks to the speakers and thanks to our audience for coming. And again, know that this will be a recorded session that you can watch at Pitzer at Home in later days. And know that we have a session, two sessions this afternoon, career services and student health services and then more sessions in the next two days. So thank you to everybody, but especially thank you too. Again, it's been nice to see you this week. And thank you all parents for your ongoing partnership. It really has meant a lot to us during this time. And um, you're definitely a critical part of our ability to be mindful of each other in action. Take care. Great. Okay. Bye-bye everyone. <laughs>